Thank you very much, Jack. And uh, if uh, I, I, I never question Jack Ames. Uh, so I won't question his last phrase about a hero of the pro-life movement. All I can say is, it's certainly, if that's true at all, it takes one to know one, Jack. And uh, I'm glad I know you, a true hero of the pro-life movement. And uh, unstoppable, the unstoppable Jack Ames. Uh, amen, amen. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a joy, a real delight. Uh, let me see if I can put this a little further away, and uh, maybe we can reduce that, that ring a little bit. Huh? But uh, it's, a, it's a real joy to come back to uh, Silver Spring, um, uh, mostly because it, Silver Spring is still in striking distance uh, of Washington, D.C. And so we like to be in striking distance um, where we can, uh, metaphorically speaking, strike a blow for life in our nation's uh, capital. And uh, always, always a tremendous privilege um, to join with Defend Life uh, in any uh, endeavor because everyone is an effective effort on behalf of the sanctity of human life and the dignity of the human person. Thank you, brother, for uh, the kind invitation and very warm welcome to the parish. Uh, we're, uh, we're so very happy to have uh, a parish uh, such as this one that will support um, a, uh, an effort on, on behalf of life that impacts not just the community, and that's good, very good, but impacts the whole nation uh, and is a witness to the sanctity of life and the dignity of the person. Well, um, November 8th was, um, there was a, a, a change in the atmosphere. Do you agree? Um, and it looks as if uh, the uh, national leadership uh, finally caught up with the national sentiment. Uh, we have been moving very deliberately toward a pro-life position in the citizenry, and it looks as we sit here tonight, uh, it looks as if the uh, government uh, will now reflect that pro-life sentiment in the citizenry. Uh, and so it should be, uh, because we are a democratic republic and uh, a democratic government should reflect the uh, convictions uh, and commitments of its citizens. Do you agree? Yeah. Uh, it shouldn't be in conflict with uh, the citizens. Uh, and uh, we, we know from uh, data uh, that's uh, coming from uh, polling and uh, uh, research that the citizenry is returning to a moral uh, position that uh, it had departed from for about a generation and a half. And now we, we see that coming back and that's uh, certainly uh, it remains to be seen just what the cause of that is, but that certainly uh, was helped along in a very real, measurable way by the pro-life movement since 1973. Um, <clears throat> because we, we know, we can
can see through uh, the, uh, the results of the election. Um, we saw it coming up from local jurisdictions through the states and then finally to the federal elections. Uh, and so we have now uh, a, a, a better reflection, not a perfect one, and that's what we're going to look at tonight, but a better one. So in light of the election, prospects for pro-life advancement are higher than in the past decade. President Trump and Vice President Pence ran on a platform opposing abortion. Supreme Court appointments opposing Roe versus Wade, as well as opposing the Affordable Care Act with its birth control mandate. Many pro-life organizations presume that the new administration will follow through with a pro-life legislative and policy agenda. If these positions are maintained and policies opposing abortion and favoring life continue to be implemented, the future will be much brighter for the millions of victims of the previous abortion regimes. Still, citizens and pro-life groups must be vigilant in seeing to it that there is no slack or compromise while Congress and the Trump administration are anti-abortion, the question remains tonight whether they are pro-life. Pro-life involves far more than opposing abortion. The defense and advocacy of the sanctity and inviolableness of human life includes the whole span of life from natural conception to natural death. Life at every stage and condition must be carefully and vigilantly protected and defended. This involves not only opposition to abortion, but to lethal and injurious research euthanasia, public violence, unjust war, and capital punishment. These present practices destroy human life, which is created in the image and likeness of God, unique, unrepeatable, and irreplaceable. Now, according to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, Catholic social teaching is based on and inseparable from our understanding of human life and human dignity. Every human being is created in the image of God and redeemed by Jesus Christ, and therefore is invaluable and worthy of respect as a member of the human family. In his magnificent encyclical on life, Evangelium Vitae, or the Gospel of Life, Pope St. John Paul declared, in giving life to man, God demands that he love, respect, and promote life. Not one of those, I might add, departing from the text for a moment, not one of those qualifiers is disposable. Pope 
Pope St. John Paul said that God demands that man love, respect, and promote life. Continuing on with the great saint. The reason for this is that the human being is created in the image of God and thus is a reflection of the exalted God in the world. In this respect, every human being no matter how or when or in what condition conceived and born, is uniquely fashioned after the Holy Trinity and remains forever in a special relationship with the Creator, who is its sole end. Now, I spent 20 years at the United States Supreme Court beginning with my own case, Reverend Shank versus Pro-Choice Network, but then staying um, at the court uh, as the only Christian mission at the United States Supreme Court. And I enjoy taking friends who visit on a private tour of the court. And uh, when we get to the court chamber itself, courtroom, I like to point to the frieze of Moses, who right now stands above the empty space uh, that was caused by the removal of Justice Scalia's chair. Uh, Moses did stand over the shoulder of Justice Breyer while I was at the court, Justice Alito, and Justice Kagan. But now Moses stands over the blank space uh, at the bench. Almost seems prophetic, doesn't it? But Moses stands there and he has the tablets of the Ten Commandments in the nook of his, of his arm. And the commandments lay over, it's just stylistically done that way, uh, cross over each other so that you can only see one commandment of the Ten in the United States Supreme Court. You cannot read the others. But I point to that freeze and I ask my visitors which commandment is fully on display above the bench of the United States Supreme Court justices. Do you know which one it is? You can read it. Lo tiratzat. You can read it if you can read Hebrew. It's in Hebrew. Lo tiratzat, you shall not kill the innocent. It's the only commandment. The fifth commandment forbids the killing of any innocent human being, blaspheming the Imago Dei, the image of God. The murder of the innocent is especially onerous to God and will be avenged and not easily forgiven. Human life, then, is sacrosanct and inviolable precisely because it is endowed with the character of the Creator. Now, pull a coin out of your pocket. Will you do that for a moment? Just pull a coin out of your pocket. So I was able to pull out a quarter out of my pocket. Does anyone need a coin? Do you have a coin? Here we go. You got everyone a coin? 
Okay, I've got a toddler going. Brother here. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll make sure that brother has one. Sorry about that, brother. I wasn't a very good shot. So you look at that coin, and uh, for most of the coins, if they're silver in color, they're uh, copper nickel clad, right? You know this, they're not silver. We wouldn't spend them if they were. So if you look at the image on the coin, either side, uh, it's stamped with an image. And it is that image that gives it its value, isn't it? If it were blank and made of the same, copper nickel clad or copper uh, coated zinc, which is what a penny is now, it's just zinc, same stuff you take for a cold. <laughs> and it's, it's uh, plated with copper, okay? So whether it's zinc or whether it's copper nickel clad, and there's very, very little nickel in a coin anymore. So it's, it's a plug without the image on it, and it's, it, it certainly, this would not be worth 25 cents without the image. The image on that coin is called the character. Human life is sacrosanct and inviolable precisely because it is endowed with the character of God. Thus, man possesses the greatest dignity, and in this respect, every innocent human being is absolutely equal to all others. Absolutely equal to all others. Human being then is inseparable and indistinguishable from human life human person, and human rights. The compendium of the social doctrine of the church states, Christ, the Son of God, by his incarnation has united himself in some fashion with every person. For this reason, the church recognizes as her fundamental duty the task of seeing that this union is continuously brought about and renewed. In this way, the church teaches that every human being is precious and deserves to be respected and protected with her or his human rights safeguarded. Foremost among those human rights is the right to live, which is the fountainhead of every other right. Without the right to life, all other rights are denied. Those who recognize this truth, that no human being is more valuable, more precious, or more entitled to life or protection than another, recognize this equality of humanity. It is precisely because we are all human and created by God in His image that we must afford each other the same rights and protections as everybody else. This very humanity, shared between men, human, and Jesus Christ, requires that life be held to be sacred and never disposable or even less desirable than death. The sanctity of life and human dignity are never opposed. Each rests on the other. 
pro-life must include the protection and advocacy of the dignity of each and every human person. The rhetoric and actions used in the campaigns leading up to the elections was very troubling to conscientious pro-life citizens and especially to Catholics. Things that were recklessly said and done by the candidates were sometimes belittling, insulting, and degrading of persons because of their religion, gender, race, economic class, disability, and ethnic heritage. Speech and behaviors on the part of national leaders that are contrary to the dignity of the human person are not only uncalled for and unacceptable, they are destructive. Disparaging persons for any reason undermines the necessary foundations of civilization. Protecting human and civil rights, mutual respect, courtesy, the presumption of innocence, and due process. Harsh words about religions, races, or classes of people lead to unjust prejudice and discrimination. It is these very conditions that often lead to the dissolution of marriage and family bonds, to public violence, to abortions, suicide, and euthanasia. The president, with his past and present derogatory remarks about women, inadvertently, but nonetheless unmistakably, reinforced nearly every negative male stereotype and condition that leads to abortion. His past remarks undeniably denigrated women as sex objects, and his remarks last year disparaged women's looks and body types. He demeaned his opponents with condescending and insulting words. And he mocked a man with an evident physical disability. Add to this his habit of detraction, and you have a consistent record of disrespect of inherent human dignity. Now President Trump himself admits he is no paragon of virtue. But that is not the point. We know proponents of abortion characterize pro-life people as chauvinists, gender-biased women haters. They portray, they portray the pro-life movement as male-dominated and pro-life women as submissive and self-loathing. The men who defend the innocent unborn are stereotyped as boorish cads who use women to satisfy their appetites. Many post-abortive women are in fact the victim of men with these traits. As long as I live, I will not forget being outside an abortion mill, blocking the entrance, and a young woman sobbing and trembling and telling me that she did not want to go in there and a giant, commanding, deep-voiced male twice her age pointing and saying, get the hell in there. Even if every other man in her life was kind and supportive. Her perception of men is distorted by the one who promised the world to her, then violated her, 
And when she told him she was carrying their child, he emotionally abandoned her and he took her to the abortionist or he took off. Tragically, President Trump did very little to dispel that male stereotype and did too much to reinforce it. Human dignity is not a neat add-on, a negotiable option to the sanctity of human life. It is intrinsic to human well-being and so to human society. To disrespect the dignity of the human person is to blaspheme against the image of God. And when I was young, I was an avid numismatist. Don't call the bishop, that's a coin collector. And I recall that a coin that was stamped on only one side and was missing the other was called an error. <clears throat> and while it may have had collector value, it lacked the intrinsic monetary value. To be pro-life means to hold equally to the sanctity of human life and the dignity of the human person. If only one or the other is adhered to, then it is an error. And while it may have political value, it will lack intrinsic moral value. The pro-life conscience must hold fast to the virtues. If we fail to fully respect the human person, we will lose the credibility of our claims, and whatever gains are made stand to be lost in the next election. Thank you.